Good evening. Welcome to Moral Politics. I'm your host, Valerie Tarico, and this is our monthly series, Christianity in the Public Square. Most people think of religion as something that improves their quality of life, as something that adds joy, friendship, connection, and purpose. But for other people, religion can be horribly damaging. Our guest tonight, Dr. Marlene Winnell, is a psychologist who specializes in recovery from toxic religion. Welcome to the show, Dr. Winnell. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, Valerie. So help us to understand, the, the, the notion of religious recovery must sound so odd to some people. Can you tell us why it's necessary? Well, as it turns out, recovering from certain kinds of religious indoctrination is much more difficult than people think. It's not like finding out there's no Santa Claus or just walking away from some kind of club that you used to belong to, like Girl Scouts, and you're no longer are interested anymore. It's actually much deeper than that, and for good reason. What do you mean for good reason? Well, children are taught at a very early age, before they can process anything cognitively, before their brains are developed, uh, to believe in things that are quite deep and quite serious, like being told that they're going to go to hell if they don't believe. And the story of the Bible, the story of the atonement, that they have to believe in Jesus and that Jesus is coming back. And some of these things are uh, quite serious and quite literal to where even at a uh, later age in adulthood, when people are functioning just fine in other ways, they can deep down still have a fear that they don't understand because it's basically a phobia indoctrination. A phobia indoctrination. But I think of the of people telling children stories from the Bible, think of children being able to pray. Most people, I think, would perceive that children are comforted by believing in a heavenly father or by believing that Jesus watches over them or, or that they have a guardian angel. Is that not the case? Well, there are different versions that are ta taught to children, and there are more moderate churches, and certainly families and pastors and, and uh, groups can mediate what the message is. And so there are certainly uh, different versions of it, and sometimes children are given a more loving version of God. But in the evangelical fundamentalist version of the Bible, and just to be clear, when we talk about that, uh, fundamentalists are people who take the Bible, literally every word, it's the inerrant word of God, and there is no other way to view things. There's no other way to uh, to uh, have a relationship with God and there's no other way to be saved after you die. So if you don't go along with the program, you are damned for eternity. So despite all the good messages, despite the stories about Jesus and, and the miracles and uh, the good things about how to give to the poor and how we should love each other, there is this underbelly. There's always this fear at the base of it. You use the word phobia, that's a clinical term. Are you actually saying that that this religion that children are exposed to can cause clinical phobias? Well, a phobia is when you have a, a fearful reaction to something that is irrational because it has had an association in, so, in some past experience that is so strong that you can't separate it and you can't, uh, you can't react to it with any kind of rationality. You have an irrational response of fear that has nothing to do with your more reasonable understanding of the situation in the present. So, so give me an example. Well, it's like somebody who, uh, you know, in, in some of the classic, this is called from, from the research on classical conditioning, uh, and uh, Pavlov's dog being conditioned to respond because of uh, just hearing the bell. And so with a phobia, it's a, a, a terrifying kind of experience where you have had, let's say, as a child you were chased by a dog. Can you describe a specific religious phobia that you've encountered in your work? Well, a phobia is, uh, for example, it's not just hellfire. It's what's going to happen to you if you leave the group. Now, a lot of religions, a lot of groups, any kind of authoritarian group, and sometimes it's not even just religious, but religions are particularly good at this, where there's a threat that terrible things are going to happen to you if you leave, and things, uh, these things are going to be here and now. You will have uh, nobody to uh, take care of you and protect you. You're going to be out there in a terrible world. You're going to suffer depression, mental illness. You're going to be on skid row, be drug addicted. 
uh, go insane and you, you won't be able to function. And this is very, very frightening. As so what you're saying is when someone leaves their religion, part of, if that's been the message, then they become afraid that those things are going to happen to them. And they start perceiving cues or signals that, um, that they're becoming mentally ill or that they're becoming immoral, um, that kind of thing? That's right. I, I worked with a, a group of people that lived in a uh, commune where they all believed in this one uh, version, uh, this one religion very seriously and uh, had given all and they lived there totally dedicated and then when they left and were trying to get jobs and find apartments and find a new life, every little setback, you know, like if they didn't get a job that they applied for or they weren't able to find an apartment or they got lonely, every little thing was huge and frightening and it was a sign of God that they were doing the wrong thing and they should go back, go back to the group because this was proof that, that uh, that they were sinning and that they were headed for disaster. When actually in the real world, we all face setbacks. We face setbacks all the time and we don't interpret them that way. So it's what you're saying is that the indoctrination and expectations is what makes it even more frightening. It makes those minor setbacks in, feel enormous. Yes, yes, because everything is related to God's will and God's will is totally dependent on you obeying this formula and then, uh, you know, after you've supposedly become part of this group and you have your salvation, which, by the way, isn't guaranteed in a lot of groups. A lot of groups, you're constantly in a state of anxiety trying to make sure that you really are saved. I have a lot of uh, sympathy. I mean, uh, clients that I've had who've gone up to the front of their church, the altar call, they call it, and they've, like, been saved and dedicated their lives to Christ over and over again because they're not quite sure it, it's it's really in the bag, you know, the fire insurance is really there. But then beyond that, in order to be in God's will, there's daily anxiety about whether all the decisions you're making are the right ones. Because you're not allowed to trust your own judgment. You're not allowed to trust any instinctual uh, wisdom that you have. It's wrong and bad. So not only does the person feel frightened, they also don't trust their own ability to discern what's real or what's right or to make decisions. That's right, and they're also being told that there are all these forces. There's a spiritual world there. We have our physical world, but there's a spiritual world. There's uh, forces of good and evil, God and Satan, and they're trying to impinge on you and, and, and influence you to do different things. So you're constantly trying to figure out what's going on on that. So level. You're, you're talking about literal evil spirits? surrounding us, people perceiving that they're like, like ghosts, or what are you talking about? Well, different groups will interpret it different way, but, but, but serious fundamentalists, uh, especially charismatic groups, take it quite literally in terms of even demon possession and exorcism, the whole bit, uh, but, but uh, even less radical wait, wait, yeah, groups... I'm sorry, back up. Demon possession? You're, you're talking head spinning? What are you, what are you talking about? You know, when I was young and uh, um, The Exorcist came out. That, well, that's what I'm thinking of. I couldn't watch it. You couldn't watch I it? I couldn't watch it because the church I grew up in took that literally and seriously. And I would be much, much too frightened to watch that. Wow. And pol Poltergeist was just out of the question. Couldn't watch that. Yeah, uh, because that stuff was real. And in my church, you know, there were, you know, it, it, uh, it would happen, you know, somebody would be writhing on the floor or something and somebody would be trying to cast out an evil spirit and uh, this goes on, it goes on all the time now, it's not something that's ancient. Wow, writhing on the floor, evil spirits, it's, it's, it, it, it's kind of odd to think that what we're talking about is 2008. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you could be using the same words a hundred years ago, two hundred years, a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me about your practice, it focuses, you say, on recovery, on people who are coming out of these kind of belief systems mm -hmm. and trying to find a way to live in, in a different world, in a different reality. Well, uh, it's interesting because uh, there hasn't been nearly enough ten attention to this and part of what I'm trying to do is raise it to some public consciousness that this, this is a serious area of uh, recovery, just like alcoholism or child abuse of other kinds. By the way, I, I consider this to be child abuse. If you 
teach children these kinds of terrifying ideas. Those are harsh words. Because uh, ideas are, will shape you and will terrify you and last for a lifetime. I mean, I have talked to people that are 65 and still struggling and have spent their lives trying to uh, shed this and they're still struggling. So um, yes, I consider it child abuse. And so when someone is trying to uh, let it go and move on, they are going through a process that can sometimes take a long time. They're gathering information. They're sometimes, when they finally, uh, say, go to college or get out of the confines of their, their family, are able to get a little more information and find out that there are other worldviews, there are other people that see things differently that aren't crazy or stupid or immoral and seem to be okay, and that's kind of an interesting thought. And then they also start discovering cracks in the system. They start seeing that the church can be corrupt and people can be hypocrites, you know, and some of the pastors that are preaching about all the sexual sins are actually having affairs, and the Bible has all kinds of problems. <laughs> well, you know, you as I were both raised on the kind of idea that Christians are forgiven, not mm -hmm. perfect, not right. perfect, but forgiven. Yeah. And um, yet, but, but what you're talking about, you're using such weighty words that I mm -hmm. want to kind of push a little harder on this. That, I mean, you use the word child abuse, mm -hmm. you're using the word recovery, mm -hmm. you're talking about analogies to substance abuse, mm -hmm. um, to peop to addiction. Um, it's hard for me, and I would imagine it's hard for most people, to actually picture those words fitting when someone walks away from their religion. Mm -hmm. Like, can, can you give us, can you, without naming names, without breaching confidentiality, can you tell us any stories of people you've worked with, experiences they've had, um, something that would lend credibility to this, I mean, you saying child abuse and psychopathology and big words like that? The thing that always breaks my heart is when somebody tells me that, that they're 35, 40 years old and they can't get through a night. They can't sleep through a night without waking up terrified. With waking up terrified? Because the rapture might happen. And they can tell me that as a child, because they were told that Jesus was gonna come back soon, any minute, and there are all these things in the Bible about signs of the end. And by the way, uh, that's another feature is this focus on the end times. And right now there's so much going on in the world. There are some, you know, we have a lot of troubled things going on. And you can, just like horoscopes can fit anybody, these, these things that are going on can, can uh, match descriptions of what is spoken of in Revelations and so forth. And so people will say that Jesus is coming any day. And the story is that he's going to come and the true believers are going to get raptured up into the sky to meet Jesus and go away including the dead that are believers, and then everybody else is going to be left on earth. Uh, and this has been the theme of this best-selling novel series called Left Behind, and it, it's absolutely terrifying. Uh, I've, read, so, I've read Left Behind. And, it's gruesome. Yeah, and, and there was a, um, a film years ago that a lot of my clients were forced to watch, and this is, a, this is part of the child abuse. It was called A Thief in the Night, forced to watch it as a child and people thought it was good for them to be scared and this showed you know Jesus came back people were left behind and then what happens is is the tribulation where there are all these horrible things that happen on earth and there's an antichrist that tortures everybody for seven years and, then, and then Jesus comes back with conquering armies there's an army a fight with Satan final judgment this whole scenario and so children who wanna, they don't wanna be left behind. And by the way, the other, another aspect of the child abuse is abandonment. Abandonment, Using as a psychologist, parent. well, humans, unlike other animals, do not survive if they're not taking care of their parents for quite a long time, for like the first two years of life. So we are wired to be very worried about being abandoned. We need to be taken care of in order to survive. So the idea of losing our parents is a scary thought. And what you're saying is that the rapture is, in the child's mind, an abandonment. The, the, the rapture it is like tapping into your worst and deepest fear. And I find that to be just heinous. 
And so clients, and this is not just that one, but, but many clients have told me that they had this experience as a child of every time they couldn't find out their parent, like they'd go in the house and they'd see a broom on the floor and mom's not around. And they would be sure that mom was raptured and then just freak out, running around trying to find mom. And that this would happen repeatedly. And that's, to me, horrible. So as you talk about this, I'm remembering something I read last year or a couple years ago about these hell houses at Halloween. The oh, idea yeah. being, I saw uh, that. did you? Something about scaring kids into yeah. believing, saving their souls that way? Yeah, what kind of a religion is it that you have to scare people into believing? So, well, and I guess what you're saying is it's the stuff of nightmares, uh -huh. consciously, deliberately the stuff of nightmares, but for some kids, it creates real nightmares that can last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, real nightmares, and then the thing is they don't know what the alternative is. And uh, I think that well, what just is, the what idea the of you know having a life without God, that just seems like it's not possible. What would life be like if I didn't have a relationship with God? What would the universe be like without God? Just, uh, just the existential terror of that makes people hang on for a long time. And like myself, many and many of my clients hang on for a long time, trying to make this uh, the good parts work. I had a very emotional, satisfying relationship with Jesus when I was young and, and as a teenager, even, despite the fear, because I thought I was, you know, I had my own. Uh, life in order, but I also was pretty racked with anxiety about all the other people I was supposed to witness to and save. I couldn't just relax and be a kid and have friends. I had to make sure they were saved, which is really uh, a hard thing on children. Um, so, Mar Marlene, isn't let me isn't is this people who would maybe or, or would have anxiety disorders anyway? Like, is there, are you really saying there's a causative effect of the kind of religious indoctrination, as you put mm -hmm. it? Um, or are these just kind of depressive, anxious people with God, without God? Well, I think that people who have a, a sensitive personality uh, will take it more to heart and be more damaged by it. Some people get do get more damaged by it. but. I don't think you can chalk it up to personality or anxiety disorders at all because these ideas are extremely powerful and they affect people, uh, a, a lot of people. Well, and, so, and, so, and what you've also said, at least in your brochures, is that the people who come out of recovery work quite often lead very happy, healthy lives. Is that? That's right. That's right. But it takes, it takes courage. It takes. Uh, some effort to uh, take some steps to gain some more information to at least um, make those baby steps towards uh, having faith that there there is another way to live and and get some help to acknowledge that it's not working oh, that and that's another thing people stay in because one of the messages you get is that if it's not working for you then it's, it's your fault. You haven't really dedicated yourself enough to Christ. You must have some secret sin. There's something you're doing wrong. So if it's not working, people keep going back and trying it again. Because God's perfect. Jesus is perfect. The whole deal is, is faultless. So you must be doing something wrong. If it's so many Christians, even though they're still in the church, are utterly miserable. It's not just the people that are out and trying to recover. Wow. You mentioned Christians, fundamentalist Christianity specifically. Are there other kinds of religions that you find yourself that that they come, people come to you from other religions as well, seeking to kind of find a path to a, a place that works better for them? Any dogmatic uh, authoritarian group that robs you of your own your own faith and your own ability to think and feel. So. Uh, there are a lot of Bible-based groups, uh, Je Jehovah Witness, Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, but also Eastern groups, Eastern religions, uh, Muslim, anything that is authoritarian, basically. That's, that's the main feature. And so when people, and the healing end, ends up being similar, where the beliefs are not as important as what they need to, to learn, to do to uh, function adequately, which is to regain, regain who they are, 
uh, my retreats that I do, weekend retreats are called release and reclaim because they need to release some of these toxic beliefs and there's some ways to do that and, and examining them and realizing what's wrong with them is part of it but also on more emotional, deeper levels, and then to reclaim themselves and reclaim their lives and build up their new identities and their new lives. They have to reconstruct, basically, from the ground up. So retreats really does sound like recovery work. I'm uh -huh. picturing AA yeah. meetings, and I'm I actually, I'm wondering, can you tell us more about the retreats themselves? What's, what's the focus? Um, how much is you kind of doing therapy, if you will, and as opposed to people connecting with each other? Yeah, um, people come, it's a, it's a small group, it's a weekend marathon kind of thing, like I, I sometimes joke about it being a weekend slumber party because we also have a lot of fun, and but people come from, from all over, sometimes people fly from a long ways off because they can't find anything like this, there, there are very few services available, very few people that understand well, how I was going to ask, this is. Is there, is there a network of therapists, of psychologists who works that specialize in this area? No, it's not an area of specialty in psychology and I wish it were and that's what I'm saying about trying to make it more visible and, and uh, letting people know that it's needed and uh, wanting to do some training in that area but uh, it's not recognized as a serious thing to uh, recover from. Mm -hmm. People think you can just grow up and leave it like something adolescent you don't you know, you know stop going to church you know if it's bothering you. So, so part of what um, Part of what people must discover in the retreats is that they aren't the only person suffering. Well, that's one of the most powerful things about the retreat. I do a lot of activities, I give information, I have uh, exercises that we do, and all of that is great. And, you know, and concepts, labels that can help people realize that it's, you know, that, that, you know, to put around the experience so that it's not so amorphous and scary. But what they end up saying is that what was really healing, that the synergy of people that were there and finding out they're not alone, and the example of other people also making the same effort and, and the success. And then we have follow-up, we have an online support group and conference calls where people follow up and they support each other because they know it takes a while. I know there are resources online for former Christians, uh -huh. xchristian.net, um, losingmyreligion.com are some of the ones I've run across, uh -huh. but um, what you're saying is this is a different kind of experience. This is about people actually having the chance to connect with each other, to look each other in the eyes, yeah. and, and to not be alone. Yeah, yeah. I think, it's, uh, I, I think it's important to be face to face. People do get a lot out of reading those forums and participating. It's been a lifeline. I mean, I've, I've heard of people, you know, in the Deep South, for example, who are sneaking into the bathroom with their laptops, you know, to find out what's, what's going on in some of these other uh, websites, and that's, that's, that's great. great. It's really, um, the internet has really been helpful to people, but, but in person is really healing, is really very healing. Is there anything else you'd like to comment on before we wrap up here tonight? Uh, I would just, uh, like to like to give a message of hope to people that have been questioning because uh, usually it takes people years to really get to where they are confident that it's okay to leave their religion behind and they do have the ability to move ahead and create a different kind of life and there are many other people who have done that there are many people who've been through this and who've gone on to live happy joyful productive lives and they really honestly don't believe that they're going to hell. I personally do not wake up at night scared to go to hell and I don't worry about the rapture and I used to. So Thank I can say that you know you can get through it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.